Welcome to the Football Insomniac Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Watt, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Ewan Boyle. Ewan, how are you doing, mate? Doing very well, Colin. Thanks very much for asking me on. Uh, you were telling me off the air how much of a fan you are. I, I took it as a bit of a compliment, but I've got to say I love the stuff that you guys do. Tell everybody that's watching, what is it that you do and um, where can they find you after today's show? Um, well, initially, I was at Greenock Morton as their uh, media man and I took the decision to, and I, I, it's not unique at all because everybody seems to be doing it, but I took the decision to create a podcast, All Things Morton. Um, we had the great Andy Ritchie on, we had Chris Miller, we had various players. Um, so you can get that on Spotify. Um, it's called the Ton Talk Podcast because we, we just thought there was there was a there was an avenue there to get doing where clubs had never really never really had only specific like players on because it had never really been done. So we thought we we could do that, and then I've got currently just now with some Morton fans, it's called the Just One Carnato podcast, which particularly nowadays um, is just a hounding of Morton, um, which doesn't, it doesn't bring me pride, right? It absolutely doesn't. But um, the way we're playing it has created a good few houndings. But it's a good listen. I mean, it's it's honest and it's fair. Um, so I'd absolutely say it's well worth a listen. And just before we go on and talk about the main topics today, everyone that's watching that isn't a Morton fan is going to want to know why is it called Just One Cornetto? Now, I know the story, but it's worth telling it. Do you know, I can't believe you even know the story because I, I don't know the story. There is, there is <laughs> the, the reason why a song came back, I, I, I honestly could not tell you. This, if, if people remember years ago, I mean, uh, you're talking decades ago, there was a, a, a Walls ice cream advert and it was Just One Cornetto, give it to me, yep. delicious ice cream, etc., etc., um, and Morton, for some reason, and I'm hoping fans can kind of comment and say what this is about, but it's just kind of stuck with and we sing it at songs with passion, and there's, <laughs> there's, there's this odd feeling when you're sitting in the cow shed playing against St Murn, and you're singing just one carnetto that was massive, massive day. <laughs> it kind of takes away the sting of a rivalry like that, but listen, that wouldn't change it for the world. The story I was told was that someone had a Cornetto in the cow shed roughly when this came out, and it was such a boring game that somebody just started singing it and it caught on. So that was the story I was told. I've never, I'm sure that I, Morton I, fans I, might I, be able I, to verify that one. I hope they can, because I, I, I've never been able to work it out. Um, but it's just stuck and it will stick forever. So if that's a story that goes along with it, then wow <laughs> So we're telling the Morton fan how that came about. But welcome to everyone who is joining us today. We are live on YouTube, we're live on Facebook, we're live on Twitter. Um, if you are watching, give us a thumbs up. We, the channel itself, A State of Mind, just crossed 6,000 subscribers yesterday, which is an incredible figure. Um, so we're very thankful to everyone who's joining us and if you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, even on Twitter leave us a comment if you've got any questions for Ewan for his time at Morton or for any of the topics that we're coming up with then drop that in, this show is as much for you guys as it is for us but we move on to our first topic today Ewan and I always start this with something that grinds my gears now if you look back to Family Guy, Peter Griffin what grinds his gears, I've stole it I've coming into this podcast um, and what has grinded my gears in this week in football is the fact that it seems as though for a small element, it has to be said, there seems to be racism coming back into the game and it's just completely unacceptable. We look at the instance over the week we had the Millwall players that took the knee when the fans booed them um, and also last night's incident with Istanbul, Bashikar's uh, Pierre Webo being sent off because of his reaction to the fourth official's comments, which, having seen the, the footage, I agree, was completely unacceptable. Why is it that we're allowing this to come back into the game? Where where is this came from? Is it just an underground element that hasn't been removed completely? Or what, uh, what can be done to be kicked out of the game? There's a fantastic documentary, if anyone hasn't seen it, on iPlayer with Anton Ferdinand when he talks about his incident with John Terry, but that's nine years ago. And it feels as though, unfortunately, we're starting to get back to that age where there's people thinking that it's acceptable to boo players that are standing up for the BLM movement. It's it's ridiculous. I, I mean, but 
I, I hear you mention there that, that it's coming back. I don't actually think it's ever, ever left. You know, when you talk about, I'm just thinking recently with, with Rashford and the, the publicity around Marcus Rashford, there's a reason why he kind of gets singled out for 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 what he does. In, I mean, I remember there was an article out about, um, was it he'd bought, he'd bought six houses or something, but he was also de- doing um, his charity work. Now, mm-hmm. I can't who else? Mason Greenwood's another one that, that's been victimised the media. That It's all still there. And even you look back to, as you say, Anton Ferdinand and John Terry, and even Suarez and Evra and all these big incidents across the Premier League, these these have littered the Premier League for years. And I think that, what can we do about, what, what have we not done? Why are we still here? Why are we still waiting to, to do something? What needs to happen before somebody says, right, you say anything bad in your route, you're done. Because something like that needs to happen. Something as big as that needs to happen. Because this will keep going on and on for years, and nobody wants it to happen. We're still, if we're still sitting here in ten years' time discussing incidents like this, something's went wrong. And mm-hmm. I'm sure somebody said this ten years ago. T, if we were sitting here ten years, somebody's done something wrong. So I think something now needs to happen before it just gets worse and worse. And when you look at it, I mean, I actually had the opportunity to watch Anton Ferdinand's um, documentary yesterday. Um, And there was an incident that took place uh, not too long after that, where Luis Suarez and Patrice Evra um, had a bit of an incident. And at the time, Liverpool players came out with the T-shirts with Suarez 7 on the back defending him. And they actually had a chance to interview Jordan Henderson, that he was then looking back at that incident and how they reacted to it. And... At the time, he was so young and naive that he didn't understand what was actually going on. And he now comes out and admits that looking back on it, it kind of darkens his memory of the time. And I'm looking at some of the comments coming in and it, there's some people saying that the booing, the kneeling to the Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with racism, um, something to do with Black Lives Matter being funded by Soros. It's nothing to do with racism. The, the thing is, Black Lives Matter is a important movement of this era. I mean... When you look at why players are taking the knee and why they're they're standing up, of course there's people going to come in and say all lives matter, and I understand that. But at the same time, there's a section of the world that believes that because of the colour of their skin that they've been treated differently and they're taking the rights to stand up to it. And that's what the people are supporting. So when people are taking the knee, it's showing solidarity. It's not showing, showing any sort of favouritism. And to boo someone like that for standing up for what they believe in, I think that's completely wrong. Aye, I think there's, there's, as you say, there's an element of supporters, and it's not. Listen, it's it's far from everybody, right? It is, in fact, it's only a, a, a minute kind of amount of, of fans and supporters that even at that game that that booed. But even if there's just one person that's doing it, you, you, that's enough. You know, that's that's at a point where you say, hold on a minute, that's. You, you can't do that, and I, I think that I mean, you mentioned the, the, the Suarez incident. I remember Kenny Shields in the interview after it saying that Evra should be ashamed of himself, and that, and the Man United players should be ashamed of themselves. And you're thinking, why? I mean, it was a Suarez that that, that done it, and then I think even in the, 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 the handshake incident, too, mm-hmm. I think Kenny Douglas then came out again and said he should be shaking his own, but once again. You need to look at, well, somebody needs to step back. Somebody needs to step back and say, right, hold on a minute, this is, this is going on too long. What, what, what can we do? There's, there's, there's only so much you can do before you, you're edging towards it being law and unlawful and, and you get down the road of, of, um, of the law. But, I mean, that's a difficult alleyway to get down, which could cause problematic, I think. I agree with you, um, and I, I think when we look at the, the other incident that took place this week, which actually only took place last night, and that was the sending off of Pierre Webo, who was the Istanbul Bashikar's assistant manager, um, for his reaction to the Romanian fourth official's um, response. Now, the Romanians are claiming that the term was lost in translation, um, and that the actual translation referred to the person that should have been sent off as the black guy. 
Now, even that, to me, is a, an incorrect term. That's not something that you should be saying in this day and age that you come out and say, who is it that should be sent off? Oh, it's the black guy. Mm -hmm. The players all have names. It's the referee's responsibility to either learn their names or their numbers, and that should be the person that gets identified. It shouldn't be that the person was identified by the colour of his skin. Now, I don't think... I mean, you mentioned there with the... Um, we, we call him a black guy. It's... You, you can almost um, you can almost pinpoint kind of these these incidents as kind of scenarios like that because I don't think I've ever heard somebody being called a white guy. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, if there's a group of people, and I, I don't know if it's just natural, you you, you just win the day. You when they go up and say, "Oh, here are a, a bunch of white guys," or that, that doesn't happen. But it seems to be the norm that this this does happen. And I remember John Barnes used to speak about it. Um, and like when he's talking about, I think it was something to do with the, somebody was being described as the first black player to do X, Y, and Z. And John Barnes said, "Well, that, that's the biggest issue at this point. He shouldn't be the first black person. You shouldn't be seeing that as much as that's maybe a, a big a, a big thing that's happened. He, he thinks that even singling that out is is kind of a racism. But I mean, what?" As you see, the, the referee absolutely should be finding out their name or finding out what their role is. Even seeing the, the assistant manager, the, the mm -hmm. first team coach, it, 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 the referee should know us and it should be easy for him to, to decipher who's who. It shouldn't be down to oh, the black guy because it's clear that he was offended by it and incidents like that just shouldn't happen. No, and when you've seen the, the reaction from Jem Baba at the time, that was the point that he was making. He says, you never say the white guy, you always say the black guy. And that sums up some of the issues that we have in football. Everyone should be seen as an equal, whether the the different colour of their skin, their nationality, they all have a, a role to play. And in this instance, the fourth official, now they are all mic'd up, and I know that there's a documentary series going on by UEFA at the minute, which actually takes you behind the scenes of the referees, and they, they're all earpieced up, so these go into a documentary series that you can see on UEFA's website. The fact that he, whether it, he believed it was a slip of the tongue, whether he believed it was lost in translation, even had that mindset to identify the person as a black person, to me is completely wrong. And I totally understand why uh, Istanbul and PSG refused to come out and finish that game last night. Right, it's, it's no wonder. I mean, wh why would you? Because clearly, as I said, when it came down to how many races there needs to be for there to be kind of an uproar, that that's the same. If one person gets racially abused, that's all it needs to take for people to walk off a park, and that's the way to do it. You know, if you are if you're walking off a park, it is. I mean, I remember turning on the TV um, when I was watching Man United. I turned on the PSG because I heard something had happened, and. It was quite powerful going on and just seeing dead silence and, and an empty, I know obviously empty stadiums don't need Corona, but an empty stadium with no players when there should be. Mm -hmm. It was quite a powerful moment because you could see, well, they're putting their foot down. They, they, they're, they're trying something here, trying to make a point. And, and then you start to see all these the different videos of what he said and what players responded and how they responded. And I, think, I certainly think it was... It was powerful what they done, and I think this could be a change. I think we could see a shift because of this incident, and it just shows you, like, we talk a lot about fans racially abusing when, when we still and all that. It just shows you it's not just fans. I mean, there's there's fourth officials, and it, it's still rife within the game. Yeah. I mean, you take a look at what happened, obviously, in America. There was the protests earlier in the year um, with what happened over there. Games in the NBA in the baseball league and the hockey league, they were all cancelled because the players refused to take to the pitch. That saw a change in attitude slightly over in America. Now in Europe, you're in the situation where this is the first game I can remember that's ever been called off because of a racist incident. When there's been racist incidents before, either the player has went to protest to the referee, and I'm thinking of guys like Kevin Prince Boateng, um, who ended up getting himself sent off because of his reaction to it, um, we also seen the incident, um, it wasn't that long ago, I think it was in Italy, where Balotelli reacted to the, the, the abuse that he was getting. Um, 
when I go back to that Antoine Ferdinand documentary, there was the incident with the England team uh, not that long ago, I think that was 2019, where they were receiving a lot of abuse as well. And the yeah. players continue to play through the game. But you know that that has an effect on their mental well-being because they're not going to concentrate on the game. So the people that are doing this know what they're doing. But what can we do to change that? Is it an education thing where you've got kick it out? You've got all the the anti-discriminatory groups that come together to provide this information. But is the clubs responsible for this or is it just the fact that we have people like this in our society and it's then up to them what they do? Do we weed them out? Do we ban them from going to the games? It's such a difficult scenario to be in. I, and I think, like, you mentioned there with the players um, affecting their mentality to get into the game. Um, but one of my pals last night um, had he, he'd a bet on that involved PSG, and I, I was thinking because he was he was waiting on them, and I was thinking, "There's your 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 odds are doing now because because of that incident, because players players he'd go. I mean, there's, there's there's no doubt about it. If an incident like that happens, you 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 do think about that. You don't think about the game, um, but." In terms of the clubs, listen, the clubs have had it for years, and I look at clubs like Chelsea, and these clubs have been been around for years, and these incidents have, have came about for years. Yep. So, I mean, we can pinpoint a club and say, you do this, you do that, but what, what use is that going to do? Their, their fans are, have had a mentality that, that that's, I'm not saying all the fans, right? Absolutely not, but this small group of fans have this mentality that it's acceptable, and there's almost nothing... Um, that you can do that can impact it, if you know what I mean. There's almost nothing you can uh, within the clubs anyway that you can do that, that that can have any impact on on what they're doing. If that makes sense. Yeah, and it's it's such a difficult scenario, and I don't know what the next steps are because I mean, at no point would either myself or yourself go to Celtic Park or go to Capelo and expect to hear anything like that coming from the stands. Um, you don't expect to, to hear it no matter where you go but there is, as you said, there's been instance and it's not as if it's the odd one here and there it seems to be maybe one or two, maybe even more per season and it just continues to go on and that instant last night I think does have the potential to be a game changer here because UEFA are now in a situation where they have to review that in extreme detail work out what the punishment needs to be if there is even a punishment because there's every chance that they could turn around and say they agree with the Romanians that it was lost in translation, or they could actually set a precedent for what happens in the future. And I think it's one that we've really got to take a, a close look at when it goes forward to see what actually happens. Yep, definitely. It's that that this is a moment we'll, we'll look at as 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 a big moment. I, I think this is you'll see a lot of, of things come out of this, and 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 people getting sacked and. People being maybe instated as I don't know a, a racism officer or something, somebody that's going to deal with these incidents because I don't think there's anybody in just now that that does deal with these incidents. So I I, I mean as you say that this is a big moment. Yeah, I agree, and it's one we will keep an eye on for the insomnia because I think it's a major talking point in football, and that's what this show's about. We talk about the major talking points in world football, although we're both Scottish. We look at situations that happen all over the world, and that this is definitely one that we we will be keeping close to. I'm just looking at some of the comments coming in. Uh, morning to everyone who has joined us. Um, please do leave a comment if you are watching on YouTube, on Facebook, or on Twitter. Um, and that's exactly what Magnet sixty seven has done. He's speaking about the just one Cornetto thing. He says it's brilliant. He says it's almost as good as the Kelly fan singing Mickey Osmond's Paper Roses. <laughs> <Brilliant, isn't it? laughs> that's fantastic I remember the, the story being that when they made the cup final a couple of years ago she came over to perform it for them she was actually at the game from what I remember it's un unreal um, and we've got one here from a good friend of the show from John Brown, he's a big Dundee fan and he's saying how's Jim McAllister been for Morton this season many Dundee supporters, myself included were disappointed when we allowed them to leave the club He's um, he's a leader. There's no doubt about it. Jim McAllister's the, the man you look to. Um, he's been uh, probably the way we play football at Morton is the the defence often kind of clears it up. We we like to 
we are a defensive team. I think that's that's fair to say. We, we defend. Um, and what happens normally is, and this is the case for a lot of the midfielders, a lot of the midfielders are often kind of missed out because the defenders just clear it. And this midfield three of whether it be McAllister, Jacobs and Colville or various variations. Um, so we've maybe not seen him as much this year, but he's still, I mean, you still need him in your team. You know, he... The guy lives and breathes Morton. He absolutely adores Morton. Same with Chris Miller. Um, these guys came through the ranks at Morton, and they, they, as I said, they live and breathe them. So it's it's great if a player like Jim. And last year, even and even the year before that, Jim was brilliant. Jim was absolutely brilliant. And you know, towards the end of the season, we we certainly seen the the impact that he could have on on games. And there was some times that. Um, there was games where if he was out, you knew that we were going to be in a, a bit of a dire strait. So it is great to still have Jim. Um, and I think he's coming up to quite a big uh, appearances soon. So hopefully he stays around for that. And what we'll do is we'll isolate that clip and send it to Jim and hopefully he gives you something in the post for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but no, as you said, if you are watching a long comment, and I know everyone has their views on the, the BLM movement and on the, the racist instance, and to be fair, everyone has is allowed to have an opinion, whether you agree with it, whether you disagree with it. Um, if anyone does overstep the mark, though, there is certain points where you can completely overstep the mark, then that's where we draw the line. Um, but everyone's entitled to a view it is free speech after all but we move on to our second topic today um, and it's something which I found completely um, interesting over the last few days and it continues to develop after the instance last night it's Paul Pogba now Paul Pogba is very rarely out of the news these days whether it's something that he's done on the park or whether it's off the park but this time it's his agent or his represent uh, representative as they've called it Mino Raiola who is saying that his time at Manchester United is up, the player is unhappy. Uh, no, the player is unhappy on like £350,000 a week. I would take that. But he's <laughs> unhappy and he is looking to move on. He's got 18 months left on his contract at Manchester United. Manchester United are going through a terrible spell at the minute. Um, they got beat last night despite almost turning it back. But is the issue here that Paul Pogba believes that he's bigger than Manchester United? Uh, honestly, I've, I've said it for years. I like Pogba. I'm, I'll be the first to come up and say I like Pogba, but I don't think United will ever succeed if that guy's there. I, I think that because he is, thinks he's bigger than the club. I say, I'll take that back. I don't think he'll ever, they'll ever succeed if he's there in the capacity that he is. Thinking he is bigger than the club, not being a team player. The, he, he just seems to be... There's always someone about him. And it was the same with Mourinho. There was always something about Pogba and Mourinho. Well, see the question of will he play, won't he play? That should never be be the case for for a, for a manager, because you've got to have these players in a grasp. You've got you've got to have control of them. You shouldn't be waiting before a game, twenty four hours, forty eight hours before a game, and whether or not a player is going to play it. Your tactics are, are are up in the air at that point. Um, but the guy thinks he's better than the club and. That, at that point, you've got to sit, put your feet down and say, "Listen, that shouldn't be the case." I think that the, there's there's players out there that are better than Pogba that will play. For, I mean, you look at Fernandez. Bruno came in and he's been just a joy to watch, but he's played as a team. He's not thought he was better than everybody else, and it's evident. It's evident that the rewards are coming through this. But with Pogba, pff, I, I'd offload him. I think now, now is the time. Get get a, a payout. Um, for whoever wants him and just get him out because he's just nothing but a, a, a troublemaker to be honest When you look at it, I mean Manchester United spent what, 80 million, 90 million on Paul Pogba now it's not the worst 80 million they've spent because Harry Maguire's still at the centre of defence but when he's got 18 months left on his contract who would want to take on someone like that? Because it's clear that he is causing trouble within the dressing room so does he have to sit out that last 18 months of his contract or is there going to be a change and the, I'm trying to think, a change in football that would mean that if someone is in a position like that and the pl the club's desperate to get rid of him, someone, and they don't want someone that's got that, he's got 18 months left on his deal, could that change the landscape of football where the player decides, my contract's not worth it anymore, I'm not going to play here? I I, I think I absolutely can, and it's meant to even be able to say that, but 
how can a player possibly come out? I, I know it's doing to um, his, his agent, and it seems Fergie was always never complimentary about this, this Raiola or whatever. He, he's, he, he seems to be constantly in, in, in media attention and constantly being, being discussed because I, I think, like, listen, there's no doubt about it, he's got some of the, the biggest names, and I think he's got Haaland and um, there's somebody else he's got. It's a massive names, right? There's no doubt about it. But the way he goes about it, and clearly it, it affected uh, fair game his time, and that's why Pogba eventually get left, uh, eventually left Man United. That this is this is this is big. I mean, this is shoot, there's got to be a way around this. That there's there's got to be clauses now getting put in contracts saying that your agent can't come out and say that mm-hmm. the time's up because they shouldn't be able to. There's 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 no way a player player should be able to come out and say with a few months to or eighteen months to go that I'm not playing anymore because. That's not the way the world works. No, and you look at it, he is, and as a lot of the comments are coming in saying, he's a fantastically talented footballer. He's done it for his country. He's done it for Juve. When he wants to, he's done it for Manchester United as well. And the comment coming in here from David Kelly, Pogba is a player that has to have a team built around him, not brought in as part of a team. Fans get the best out of him that way, but I'm not sure it works within club football. And that's the point I'm making. Where would he go that a team's going to build a club around him? You won't find a top European side that will say, that's the guy I'm going to build my team around. You're not going to see a Barcelona or a Real Madrid or even a Bayern Munich or anybody else in England that's going to say, I'm going to spend the money that's needed to get someone like Paul Pogba in and I'm going to build my team around them. You're probably going to need to make a step down before someone would even take that risk on you. I think absolutely, and I think as well to to get to get back to David's point that France got the best out of him. I, I think France got the best out of him because he'd nowhere else to go. You know, he's got no option. It's not so he can say, no, "I don't want to play for France anymore. I want to go and play for Italy, or I want to go and play for Germany." You can't do that. You're stuck. So you've got to almost play. You're almost you've got no choice but to play. So I think in that sense. He, he, he had to play as well as he has for for France. And in terms of United, listen, there's there's very little teams that knowing what he's done at United that will go in for him and think is he's a guy I like because listen, he's a talented player. Do you think he's one of the world's best? I, I don't. I think there's far far better players out there than than Paul Pogba. But I think that he's still a player you would like in your team. Listen, let's not kid ourselves on. As, as much as you know the best, he's still a player you want in your team. But in terms of mentality, in terms of, of the impact he can have in a football club, is it worth the risk? Probably not. And we've got some people that watch us quite regularly commenting. We've got Mr Briggs here saying, Pogba is one of the best midfielders in the world. Take a look at his performances in the France team at Euro 2016 and Euro 2018. It's day and night to what he does at Man United. And that sort of backs up the point you were making a minute ago. Uh, We've got Mark coming in saying, Paul Pogba sells football jerseys. First three weeks at Man United, worldwide sales were 190 million. And that's the thing, you are bringing a superstar in, in Paul Pogba, despite whatever you feel his ability is, you're bringing a superstar in because he is, he's going to sell jerseys. Um, in the same way that even towards the end of the career, signing a guy like Francisco Totti or players like that would have definitely guaranteed um, the players, uh, the, the club, sorry, the revenue from the shirt sales. But for me, I just don't think it's a risk that any of the big teams are going to take. So with his, his uh, representative coming out and saying, yeah, his time's up at Manchester United at January, he's definitely going to move, he's definitely going to move. I can't see him getting the move to a team that he wants to go to. In his head, he thinks he can go to a Real Madrid, he thinks he can go to a Barcelona, but I just can't see them being interested in taking that risk on. I think, I mean, you mentioned Real and Barca here, I think, I think we forget how bad they actually are nowadays, they, they uh, not exaggerate, but it's a bit of a tragedy what's going on at, at Barca and Real Madrid, because they just seem to be miles, miles off it, but in this year, would they take Pogba? Maybe because of how much they're struggling. But see, mm-hmm. in the next couple of years when they start doing well, they wouldn't they touch him. They wouldn't they touch Paul Pogba. And I don't no. blame him because what's, what's, what's the need for a risk? I mean, what, why would you go out your way just to risk having, yes, a very, very talented player, but a very, 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 very talented player that causes problems? It's just not worth the risk. 
Yeah, and the, the comments keep coming in on this because he, he is someone that really sparks the conversation. We've got Conturk67 here saying, he's immensely overrated, not good enough to be a leader himself, needs multiple stars around him to win big trophies. And that also goes back to the point we made on uh, France winning um, the Euros. So we've also got Smitty Boy here saying, it's a good point, the clubs need to react and include clauses to prevent agent funny business. The game has evolved into some kind of monster and it's stemmed from the days of the Bosman ruling. Now that was a point I made to you when we were discussing this topic um, in the last couple of days when we do our research on it. Now the John Mark Bosman thing was 1995 um, when he was trying to make the move from Standard Liège to Dunkerque um, in France. And at that point, it basically kind of ruined his career because it took five years for the ruling to actually come through that this changed the way football was going. It could be that this has the potential to do the same thing and bring in a new rule into football, as you say, bring in new clauses. But when you compare the kind of careers of Jean-Marc Bosman to Paul Pogba, it's night and day. It's not that uh, Bosman wasn't a star of his time. He was moving to a lower division club and he was actively trying to, to change the way that transfers worked. But it seems to me that Pogba's just spat the dummy out. I I think we could be looking at the Pogba rule. I think this could be the start of something that the best example I can give of the of the impact that the Bosman rule had, um, Morton. I'll keep going back to Morton throughout this because <laughs> they're great team there. You know us. But um, Morton played Falkirk, Ray McKinnon's Falkirk, which was a, a big a big deal at the time. Um, and it, it was it was neck and neck for relegation. It was a big game um, because obviously Ray McKinnon had left us after two two months, three months, something like that. And, and we were playing them to stay up, basically. Mm-hmm. But in the January, so this was in the March, February, something like that. But in the January, um, it had been supposedly, but it was almost definitely true, that Michael Titzer had agreed to join Falkirk at the end of the season. So there was, it got to this big game because um, Jonathan Johansson was under a bit of a, a threat at that point. People were saying he's going to play Titzer, will play, will Titzer play as well as he should. Um, and Michael Titzer started, but there was this worry constantly over whether or not, because he's playing against his almost future team, because he's mm-hmm. got to relegate them, pretty much relegate them the, people were confused and people were worried and I think the Bosman rule that's the impact of the Bosman rule and if you keep it under wraps that a player is now leaving then fair enough you keep it under wraps but because it had been announced and because people I mean Michael Titsa was an exceptionally talented player but because people knew he was leaving there was worry and he absolutely strolled it but I mean if it's any other player would they have done the same I don't know that, that is the problem that it comes yeah, and you, you've seen that quite often in football when players sign these pre-contracts in January when their contract's coming out. If they're playing against the team that they're uh, moving to, there's always that thought in the back of your mind that, well, they're not going to try as hard because they don't want to see the other team fail. And especially when you've got a situation like that when the two teams are going kind of head-to-head for relegation, it's in the back of your mind that if he doesn't play well today, you know it's because he wants to keep the other team up. And it's not fair on the players because they are professionals. Um, but when you see something like this that comes out from Pogba and Conturk 67 makes the point that before last night United were on a great run of form out of the blue Pogba and his agent dropped that before a crucial Champions League game and it was literally just as Oli Gunnar Solskjaer was doing his pre-match conference which is incredible timing the fact that he didn't pull his agent up and has remained silent just makes him look bad and that's the point that Gary Neville made as well he believes that this was pre-planned and pre-released so that it would put United off for this. And it's almost as if Pogba was determined that Man United drop into the Europa League, which actually happened because they lost the game, and it gives them even more of an excuse to sell him in January. I mean, I, I didn't really think it that way, but it, it absolutely makes sense. And I, I'd love to I'd love to sit in the changing room with Pogba after his agents came up with that and just ask him, what, what is it your, what's your intentions here? What what is it you want for us? Because he's got eighteen months in a contract. I don't know what clubs he wants or what clubs expects him or what clubs he expects to buy him. But there must be something in his mind that thinks, right, we've got to come up with this plan that's going to make me leave the club. And mm-hmm. his plan he's put in place hasn't worked. 
all of these years they haven't worked. Now maybe we're going to see a change because this hasn't actually happened before with Pogba. There's there's been um, there's been obviously murmurs in the press about Pogba wanting to leave and etc cetera, etc. Cetera, but this what what Raiola hasn't done now has it's, it's never been done. So I mm. think is this the moment that we're going to see Pogba finally leave United and and finally give him a bit of rest? You know what these these last couple of years has been horrible. To de- I know mm. it's I know it's mental to say dealing with Paul Pogba is horrible and having Paul Pogba in your club is horrible. But it has been, and they've been constantly out in the press talking about it. And I think now will they get a bit of a bit of, a bit of relaxation from Paul Pogba? I, I hope so because maybe after that you might see the return of the, the great Man United that that has been dormant for all these years. Mm. Definitely, and it's one that's definitely worth keeping an eye on. And I know that someone that was very close to us that we lost this year. Um, the, the great Jerry McHugh, the great maths teacher of Notre Dame in Greenock, he would be uh, he would be disgusted in the situation. And um, but obviously, with best wishes to his family, we sadly lost him to to coronavirus this year. And he's a he's a sad miss at Capello, and he's also a sad miss amongst the the Man United support. So um, rest in peace to to Mr McHugh. So. Every time I have a guest on here, you I always ask them the same question, and it becomes a sort of feature piece in this show. And what it is is the football dream dinner party. So, for anyone that hasn't watched this before, what we do is we take a look at four ex players or ex managers, um, dead or alive, because we've managed to bring them back from the dead just for this one night for Ewan's dinner party. It's hosted in Ewan's house. Ewan, you're cooking. What would you cook? What's your speciality? I'm. Um- Worst cook ever, so it would just be a nice wee cheese toasty. I would need to do <laughs> <laughs> cheese toasties all round. Um, but four, four ex players and ex managers, um, dead or alive, they're all coming over to Ewan's house. It's a bit like um, the, the Channel 4 program where they're reviewing everybody's, yeah, that one. So, who is the first one to come round to your house for the dinner party? The first two is, is cliche, um, but with reason, certainly the second one, but the first one. Is, is Maradona, you know, the, the guy's just a madman, an absolute madman. And I think you look back over over the, the whole period of football, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating, I hope people can almost appreciate this. I don't think you'll ever see anybody that will have the influence of Diego Maradona on football. You know, you talk, you talk Messi... You talk Messi versus Maradona or Pele versus Maradona. Listen, Maradona's funeral will be 10, or should have been, I don't know if, what Corona's like over there, but that'll be 10 times the size of any funeral in football. And I think that influence, you know, it doesn't go unnoticed. and It doesn't happen just mm. for nothing. I think Mar- Maradona seemed an absolute madman, and you listen to stories for Liam Gallagher, and he's just, he's just, he's just off his nut. And I, I think that's brilliant about him. I, I, it was a shame when it, when he passed. It, listen, I didn't grow up watching him, but you knew you knew all about him. My, my dad said yep. he, he always says he's the best of all time. Um, but you know, and there's very few players you know all about, whether it be Maradona or, or Zidane or, or, or these great players. These are all the the pinnacle of football. Um, but you know, I don't think you'll ever see anybody speak it as highly as people have about football players as they have about Maradona. I just think he's the greatest. So Maradona is the first one in the Boyle household uh, for a cheese toasty. Who's the second one through the door? Um, the second one, as I say, this is all cliche, but the second one is Sir Alex, but with with reason, with reason. Um, I just wanted to read you a wee quote just now that I've got up my phone here. Now, we all know what, who Sir Alex is, what he's done, Um He's probably the best manager of all time, but I'll read you this quote. Sir Alex said, we won League Cup titles, three cups in a row, and dumped Real Madrid out to gain a European trophy, but we still couldn't beat effing Morton. Now, I think that is a testament to the great club of our um, I think, I, I always, you know, you hear all these stories about Aberdeen come to Morton, and maybe the comments will, will, will let us know about it. I think Sir Alex Ferguson's Aberdeen came to Morton and played Morton six times and not once. 
could they beat Morton? Mo- Mo- I mean, they beat Real Madrid, as I say, they won three cups in a row, but they could they beat Morton? And I, I think, as I will say with, with, with my next um, dinner guest, you know, it's all done to... It's all doing it to one man, and I think that team back then in that era um, was was ridiculous. I mean, I, I remember the, I think it was Willie Miller told the story that when they were travelling down, so they would travel down to Aberdeen on a team bus, everybody would be buzzing, sat the morning, they're going to, down to Cartlow, a nice wee stadium, and they said once you approached Port Glasgow, I, I mean, everybody would be talking on a bus, having a laugh, having a joke, they reached Port Glasgow, and it was just dead silence, because they knew that they were just about to play Morton. And I, I've, I've always wondered if it's just a kind of metaphor for for how good Morton was or if it was genuine. And something tells me that it probably was genuine, but just to ask Sir Alex of, of what he tried to do to, to beat Morton and obviously talk to him about, about Man United and how he adapted over the years to, I mean, bringing in Van Persie was, was one of his, his greatest, greatest signings because... He knew that he had to do something, and it was bold. But he, he, I, I'd say Sir Alex Ferguson definitely. So it was interesting. We had Ali Beg on the show last week, um, and he was telling me about how his granda was influential in Sir Alex Ferguson's career. His granda was a news reporter at the time in the Paisley area, and the owner of St Mirren at the time reached out to him and says, "I'm looking for a a new, a young coach, someone that can." Um, bring the team forward and he suggested Alex Ferguson to him so when Ali went to work at Manchester United TV and Sir Alex was the manager um, he brought the story up and he says everything changed Sir Alex was always here's a wee cup of tea here's a coffee whatever and he's been his mentor right through so it's incredible how one small decision can have such an impact in football it's, it was a brilliant story to hear and anyone that hasn't heard it check out last week's show with Ali to to hear it from the man himself so we've got some comments coming in, and if you are watching and if you've got your own dream football dinner party, let us know. Ewan has his first two picks. He is Maradona and he's Sir Alex Ferguson. Mark coming in saying that Maradona was more than a footballer. He united Argentina regardless of the difficulty, the differences, and that that was he was a complete national hero. And you've seen the outpour of grief since his passing, um, and it's been um, incredible. Mister Briggs saying, "Do you know who would be a compelling dinner party guest purely because of the career he's had?" Nicholas Anelka, from the highs of Madrid to Bolton, he's the original Pogba, undoubted talent but bad agent influence. Aye, definitely. Have you seen there's a there's a a documentary on Netflix. Oh, amazing! It's all about Anelka. Oh, right, okay. Anelka, but oh wow, it talks about all of that. How he, the the France incident when when the players um, when they walked off, and all of that we. Is it Raymond Blanc, maybe that was a manager at the time, can't remember. But um, it's the 06 World Cup, I think so. I when they all walked off, they, I mean, I think they, they finished bottom of the group and all of that, mm. uh, but they talked about that and how influential an Elka was in that. But it's certainly, if anybody's not seen that, it's well worth a watch because it's fascinating. It's in French, which is the only issue, but you get your subtitles on, you'll be fine. It's brilliant. <laughs> So Maradona, Sir Alex Ferguson, who is coming at the th- as the third guest? Um, I mentioned there that there's there's one reason why uh, Aberdeen struggled as much as there was, and I was so so lucky to have him on um, my Morton podcast when I done it. The great Andy Ritchie, um, he, he is the greatest player that's never played for Scotland, and I, I don't say that lightly. Um, Ritchie never ever got a Scotland call up. He had a few run-ins with, with Jockstein back in the day and he, he was said he was going on a flight to, to one of the, the World Cups and then Jockstein last minute pulled them out and stuck them in the, the under-21s. Um, but listen, there's Andy Ritchie, you don't get players like Andy Ritchie and you'll never get players like Andy Ritchie ever again. I think that, I mean, there's, there's a story where um, Strachan, Gordon Strachan said the story that when they were, they used to do their, their team talks and uh, in, in the lead ups to, to to the Morton games. And Sir Alex, it would be a Wednesday, and Sir Alex used to always tell them, "Listen, watch Andy Ritchie, right? Don't forget about every everybody else on this pitch. Watch Andy Ritchie, and you make sure he does nothing today." And they're saying it each day, Thursday, right? Watch Andy Ritchie, make sure he does the day end, and Friday, right? Make sure Andy Ritchie does the score tomorrow. <laughs> and Andy Ritchie, so I can't mind who took the. 
the, the kickoff. Um, so you could hear, as Shaggy said, at the start of the game, you could still hear Sir Alex out and watch Andy Ritchie, make sure the guy doesn't score. So then, <laughs> so whoever was up front with Big Andy to start has laid it after Big Andy. Halfway the line, Richie has lobbed the keeper. And this was Jim Leighton. I think it was Jim Leighton at the time. Richie's chipped the keeper. And he said, sat and said, I looked over at Sir Alex and he was red. I mean, he was red. <laughs> eyes up his eyes. His, his, his eyes were up of his socket. He was ready to kill. And I think that sticking the two of them in the room, Sir Alex and, and, and Richie, and in fact, there's another one that Richie always, he said in the podcast was, um, when Beckham scored for the halfway line, uh, mm-hmm. Richie was it was a scout somewhere. I can't remember who it was, but it was a scout somewhere, and he said he's sitting with the rest of these managers, just watching, casually watching, and um, he says up on the screen, he's seen Sir Alex talking, and so they, they call, the journalist asked them, um, he said, Sir Alex, how do, how do you feel about that? I mean, that's that's amazing scoring for the halfway line. And he says, um, I guess nothing. I used to see a boy up in Scotland there all the time, and Richie was sitting there with all these guys who wouldn't know they're talking about him. But oh, listen, these, these stories are, are, are just incredible, and I think he genuinely is the greatest player never to play for Scotland. So Andy Ritchie is in with Diego Maradona and Sir Alex Ferguson. There's only room for one more at the dinner table. Who have you chosen to complete it? I've chose only because he's my idol and for the influence he had at Morton, I've chose Jim Duffy. Now, people might not know Jim Duffy necessarily. I, th- I hope you would because he's he's been he's been around the block. Um, but in 85, 1985, and this is a testament to the player that Jim Duffy was, 1985, he won the PFA Players Player of the Year. But yeah, that, you know, he's a defender. I think it was a centre-half. Um, he won the PFA Players Player of the Year. Despite Morton A conceding over 100 goals and B Morton also being relegated, no, it's it's mad that he, he must have been a top player. But listen, when he came to, uh, to manage Morton and getting us in the playoffs and getting us to Hampton, now I know for some of the Celtic and Rangers fans, this is just night and day for them um, getting to, to Hampton. And but you, you know, seeing your local team play at Hampton in a in a, in a major tournament semi final, it's it, it was so. It brought us so much pride, and I'll always hold him in the highest regard for it. He was certainly someone that did bring um, a bit of rejuvenation in Greenock. You've seen a lot of people going along to the Morton games that hadn't been for a long time. There was a bit of unity there. The squad that he pulled together was very impressive. And as you say, making the League Cup semi final, I think that was the first time Morton had made a semi final for over 50 years or something like that. Right, and the, the team, see if you look back at that Aberdeen team, you had James Madison, you had um, Johnny Hayes was playing, uh, McKenna, all these top players. Adam Rooney was there, I think. Um, but, I mean, that's, 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 that's a tough team, you know, and mm-hmm. we went ahead with them. And it goes back to the age old question if Jai Katongo had chipped it just before half time, where would we be? I, I honestly don't know. I think the question now this day is where is Jai Katongo? He's not really? exactly. You know, right at Queen's Park, surprisingly. Queen's Park. He went quiet and he had all these allegations and various stuff against him. And then he left, went abroad, and now he's at Queen's Park. And I believe he's actually doing quite well. So that completes the dinner table for the cheese toasties. Um, <laughs> we've got Diego Maradona, Sir Alex Ferguson, um, Jim Duffy, and obviously Andy Ritchie. Might just be worth phoning a takeaway. And I don't know if the cheese toasties will cover it, Ewan. Um, but that is your dinner party. If anyone is watching along wants to contribute what theirs would be, feel free to do so in the comments. So we're coming up to almost 50 minutes in you. And how have you felt being on the show today? You, you, you bro- broke yourself in. Enjoying uh-huh. it? I'm absolutely, this is the first time that, I mean, obviously I've done the podcast with, um, with the, the Morton one. And I've, I've been behind the camera talking to, to, to these players. But this is the first time really that I've been A, on a camera and B, actually been a kind of guest on it and so it is it's been absolutely brilliant so you, that actually takes me on to what my next topic is going to be and it is obviously um speaking about your time at morton so as you said you were the, the sort of media person at morton you got to do the the pre-match interviews the post-match interviews some of them are absolutely fantastic um i think there was the one that you just throw in the random question at the end like, what's your favorite abba song 
Um, <laughs> but what was that? <laughs> so you're obviously studying to be a journalist at the minute. What's that experience like? What was it like being behind the scenes at Morton, um, especially over the time that you were there? I honestly, I have the highest, highest of regards for, for my time at Morton. I'm so grateful that they let me come in and just and, and do what i done because the the experience is it's something that everybody grows up and wants. I mean, you you've, you you look at the Morton Twitter, not even just the Morton Twitter, any Twitter of your team that you follow, and you think, I could get a good go. I think I could do all right with that. I think I could get decent tweets in. And um, But it was just so, so brilliant. And listen, I'll be the first to say that my tweets were, were a bit out there, if you will. And the way I was doing it, I just want as many people to talk about Morton as possible. I want as many people as possible to be interested in Morton. So I was I was tweeting as though I was a fan. If that makes I know I'm a fan, right? But yeah. I was on it, being a fan. And I would like to think I was speaking for fans. And this experience of writing match reports, writing match previews, creating a podcast, interviews... All this is is the the most valuable of experiences, and seeing you're talking to like the players when we had John Sutton and we had we had Bob McHugh, Jim, Chris Miller, the all these players are so fascinating to listen to, and you don't realise that see sitting on a bus for two three years, it is the most riveting experience ever when you're talking to these players. I was like, because I, mean, I used to sit, I would sit on one side and. John Sutton and Bob McHugh would be sitting, and you're just talking to them about everything about football, and it is the most fascinating thing. So I, it's it's put me on a steady path to have had that. It was amazing. When you talk about your tweets, it was something that I always watched, and being a, a local boy watching Morton's results coming in, you always keep a vested interest. Um, but some of the stuff that you'd come out with, it was like. Um, if you pulled a goal back after being one down to go to one in front, it was just a big tweet that says, yeah, beauty, things like that. Um, the the song for Bob McHugh, sit down, give me Bob McHugh. Listen, I can't, I can't take, I must say that it wasn't me, it was the fans came up with that. Um, but I, I remember I created, I somehow, we came back, uh, it was air away, we won 2-1, and I came up with this word, wowza, Rooney. Now, I don't <laughs> Came for you. I thought, hey, man, this is brilliant. This is but the, the, the uproar that came for it, now, most of the fans were fine with it, right? But the uproar that, that came with it was, was mental. I mean, there was there was, pl- there was growing men. I remember reading Pie and Brothel, growing men writing paragraph after paragraph about the use of this word wows around it. <laughs> <laughs> Being me, I just used it the next week and just avoid them even there, you know. <laughs> and before you took over, there was a tweet from Morton that went absolutely viral, um, and it involves the the young player Lewis Strap, um, and basically it was worded very awkwardly. They basically said, "Strap on." Now, <laughs> when you came in and took over that, were you tempted to do that again, or was it just one of them things? that's like that's happened. It's never going to happen again. You know, and this is me, what they lie. The first thing I ever did at Morton was try and get a, a system of tweets that made sure that that scenario wouldn't happen again. <laughs> it was brilliant, but I didn't want it to ever happen again at Morton. I mean, it was, it was, it went everywhere. Listen, it was brilliant, and it went, I think it got 10,000 likes or something. But scenarios like that, as a, as, as a, a media guy, it, it's best to avoid it because it's just not worth the hassle. <laughs> So we've got a question coming in from Mark, and he's saying, "Did you have any disappointments working with any of the players?" So I'm probably, what was your kind of the the most awkward interview you had to have when you were at Morton? The, the toughest one always. We went through a period, and this was since since the start. I think it was in September or August, whenever the season started, until late December. Morton had then won a game away from home, mm-hmm. so I was having to to interview the players. As a fan, disappointed fan, um, trying to ask them fine questions that, I mean, as much as I like the come out and say, you were absolutely ridiculous today, what, what were you doing? I, I just couldn't, and that, that was probably the hardest part of the whole job, was was biting your tongue, because you felt you, you felt what the fans felt, and we, when we were losing all them games, it was tough, it was tough to do the interviews and the match reports without actually kind of nugging through them, but without being honest, I mean, mm-hmm. a lot 
you have to sugarcoat it. And uh, great thanks to David Hawking for that because he used to always read the match reports to make sure that they, they didn't they didn't put a, a club in a bad light, which is mm-hmm. absolutely fair enough. But um, that that was the toughest part, and we we eventually before the coronavirus were playing out of our skin and went unbeaten for about ten or eleven. Um, so that made life a hell of a lot easier because you were just asking them questions that that, that bigged them up, and it was at, at that point it was brilliant. Was there anyone that was kind of difficult when you were trying to interview them, or were the guys all right with you? Well, there was, I, I don't mean difficult here, but there was a young boy um, who's who's just come in last year, a boy named Calvin Orsley, who, brilliant player, really talented player, um, but he hated doing interviews, absolutely hated them, just because, maybe because he was young, and he was a bit naive, and he, he didn't know what the right answers were, and what the right answers were to say, um, so it used to... I used to remember getting into we we drew with Dundee United. We lost a last minute goal to Shankland um, away at Dundee United, who were hammering the league at this point. And but we went one 0 up through Aussie. So Calvin had scored, went put his one 0 up, and the first thought I had, other than fantastic, Morton's one 0 up at Dundee United, was Calvin Aussie just scored. I'm going to need to do an interview with him. So I remember getting into the the change room. And he's just his 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 face sank. I mean, it was as though he just didn't want to leave the change room. He's he kept saying, "I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it." But eventually, after one, two, three interviews, it was brilliant. I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. And he's he's not really been in a team as much recently, but certainly last season that, that was his breakthrough season. And it was brilliant last year. And obviously, you'll understand more than anybody um, what some of these guys are going through in football at the minute because. When you look at the run that Celtic's on, there are two wins in 12 games and you see that after the game, everyone wants to know what the manager's saying. But when it's coming from the official club outlet, you're never going to get the questions asked that you want to hear asked because the club never wants to put out a situation like that. Now, I watched the the Hearts documentary recently um, and it took you behind the scenes of when um, Nielsen was appointed. It took you behind the scenes when they brought in a, a new chief executive and you could see the owner, Ann Budge, was saying, I wanted to say this in the interview. Uh, we didn't get the chance to talk about that. This is what we want to come out. So is there sort of like when you're going to do these pre-match and post-match interviews, is there like someone saying to you, look, you, I want to get this out of the player, um, structure your questions around this topic, avoid that. Is that what it's like when you're doing the interviews? A lot, a lot of it is probably as fabricated in a way. Like I remember... The great Nicky Cadden, who I'll, I'll consider one of my favourite players ever, that played with Morton, played with us last year. Untouchable, absolutely untouchable. He had a ping like no other. Um, but I remember before one of the interviews, in fact, it was there away, he scored. And mm-hmm. uh, I remember saying to him before the interview, listen, we're getting towards the end of the season, you're out of your contract. Can I ask you, like, what you if you want to sign a new contract or if you're interested? And he said, don't do it. Don't do it. It's, it's not worth it. And I thought, as much as fans want to know, you don't want to come out and say, to, if I asked him a question, he said, no, I'm not interested. I don't want to be here. It's not what the fans want to hear. And it's not mm-hmm. worth the risk of asking him because it's going to go out in social media and it's going to, people will find out that, oh, Nick Cadden's just rejected a contract or doesn't want to extend his contract. Um, so a lot of that is 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 fabricated. And even, even the, the match reports, a lot of you kind of, and this I don't think this is a bad thing. It might be kind of lying to the, the fans that way, but you try to make Morton in as good a light as possible. And you you maybe you maybe if they had a big chance, you maybe kind of less intensify how big a chance that was. Um, mm. It wasn't a great day, in it, and I didn't I didn't enjoy almost lying to them, but I knew that you I wanted Morton to be seen in the best light possible, and I knew that the manager wanted Morton to be seen in the best light possible. So you needed to do it, and I think that that it, those two were probably the the hardest parts. Were were trying to fabricate these these interviews to make it seem as as though we were doing well, even at the points that that we weren't. And obviously now, since you've left the club, you're still doing sort of fan media with the the podcast and things like that. Obviously, on the channel here, we have the Celtic State of Mind, which is doing really really well. Across all the teams, you see a lot of um, fan media becoming so much more influential. Do you think that has uh, an important role? And when you look at developing your own career, do you see yourself having a role within fan media or do you think there's still an avenue to get fans' views across in mainstream media? 
Um, I, I think I think you think I'm a kind of first and foremost I'm a Morton fan, and I'd like you think I, I kind of read Morton relatively well. I mean, I, I'm 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 honest, but I'm also I've also worked within the club, and I know the struggles of the club, so. It, to that extent, I, I'm able to kind of give a a, 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 a a kind of straight view, if that makes sense. That mm-hmm. I don't want to a I could, like nowadays when we're, when we're not playing great, but the players are there today, and I, I absolutely still have faith. But nowadays it's kind of tough to, to watch. But on the podcast, a lot of the fans just just go through the club now. Whether that's deserved or not, it's 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 not a topic of discussion. People are entitled to their opinions, but in terms of 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 me, I kind of like to sit back, but also be honest and see what I say about the club, knowing what's happening at the club, um, which does help. I think it does help the podcast, and it helps me mm-hmm. because I'm able I, I'm able to hold myself back from just going through the club because I'm, I've, I've experienced it and I know the issues that they face, so. I think I'd rather do more media, but obviously, if if there's if people are, are wanting me to speak for the fans, which I hope I've done for the last few years, then absolutely, that's definitely an avenue I can get doing. Yeah, and you obviously, if you go on you and Twitter, you'll see the responses um, after you put the statement out saying that you were leaving the club. That the fans really did get behind you, and I think it's a testament, as you said, when you were doing the job at Morton, you were a fan. So you you could see it coming across that the emotions of when you're going maybe two or three goals behind it was it was you were gutted when you score that last minute winner there's the adulation there's the the wows are Rooney um, so it is and I think fans have a massive part to play in the way that um, people read media these days listen to media um, and having shows like this and shows like the the just one Cornetto and the Celtic State of Mind I think is really important for for fans going forward. But Ewan, we've been speaking now for, for over an hour. That's uh, that's incredible. Um and I, I think you could speak about Morton all day, but we're coming up to it. Um <laughs> someone just saying here, who is the guy? I thought he was a schoolboy, that's a compliment. You've still got the young looks, Ewan. You're doing See, well. <laughs> You're doing well. But Ewan, um you used to be the just to explain, you used to be the, the media guy at Morton. You're studying to do journalism and I can see a bright future ahead, especially if you keep the word wowser, Rooney, and the match reports going forward. But Ewan, thank you very much for joining us on, uh, well, on the Football Insomniac. I nearly said a Celtic state of mind. That's not, I can't imagine you'd be on a Celtic show. (laughs) (laughs) You'd be kicked out of cap low if that was the case. Um, I mean, we had more topics to discuss, but we're kind of out of time. We're going to speak about betting in football, about the change in sponsorships. Would that be banned? But, there's always time and we'll always find room for you here on the Insomniac to come back on. Have you enjoyed your time on the show? Brilliant. Honestly, thanks very much for asking me on. It's been an absolute delight. And uh, if you're going to check you out after the show, where can we find you, Ewan? Um, you can find my podcast on Spotify, the official Green at Morton. You can find it on SoundCloud T. You can find the fan ones on the Just One Carnetto, which is on Spotify. Or my Twitter is at Ubo, E-U-B-O, like my auntie Subo. She's not actually my auntie, but I just like to call him auntie. Um, at Ubo 1999. So it would be great if you could all follow me because, listen, I'm just trying to get, get my way up in the, in, in the, in the market, if you will. <laughs> and it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Ewan. And for everyone that's been watching on Facebook, on YouTube and on Twitter, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back next week with a new guest on the Football Insomniac podcast. Until then, have a great one. Thank you.